Good to have you here this morning. We're back in our, in our study through John's Gospel. So if you turn with me to chapter 16. And I also want to encourage you to give sacrificially to our uh, effort to try to raise funds to help our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine. Some of you I know are aware of the fact that the Ukraine is considered the Bible Belt of Europe. And it's also not only the breadbasket of Europe as well, but it's the Bible Belt of Europe. Many of the people are very devout Christians. Uh, there's a tremendous move of God's spirit there in Ukraine. There are probably two dozen Calvary chapels uh, in the nation of Ukraine. I don't know how many of you knew that. But uh, we are praying for our brothers and sisters there. As John Michael said, they have lost everything. Can you imagine having to leave your hometown right now? Leave your, your home and your animals and your friends and your neighborhood. And the only thing you can leave with is a backpack or a suitcase. And that's all you can take with you. They've lost everything, everything. And your 401k is gone. Everything that you hold dear, any, any hope of any future that you would have here as you work so hard to establish yourself, whether it's a place of business or your employment or whatever the case may be, it's all gone. Wow. Hard to imagine, isn't it? But there is coming a day, you know, the, this, this age in which we're in. It has a particular expiration date, doesn't it? And when that ex expiration date comes close, and I believe we're coming very close, the Bible tells me that in one day the economy of the entire world collapses. And then when you're left without anything, it is essential that you have Jesus, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, as we go through John's gospel, Jesus has told us time and time again that if you love me, you keep my commandments. And those commandments are to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves. right? He is the Lord Jesus the Christ. Do you believe in a lordship salvation? You see, those people who have lost everything realize that Jesus is Lord of all, all. But in the affluence of the society we live in and the creature comforts and some of the unfortunate compromises that have been made, he hasn't become Lord of all. If he's not Lord of all your life, then there's a question as to whether he's Lord at all in your life. Do you understand that? And we're going to be looking at this portion of John's gospel, finishing up chapter 16, and we're going to see three different people groups in attendance there at this last Passover Seder. And this is what Jesus was celebrating. He said, with fervent desire, I have longed to celebrate this Passover with you. He's going to be leaving them. And so what he has been sharing are the most important things he could possibly share with those whom he loves and he's leaving behind. These last five chapters that we've been going through from chapter 13. At the end of chapter 12, it ended the public ministry of Jesus to Israel, didn't it? Why? Why? Because of the national rejection. He talked about that as we moved further into chapter 14, that he was rejected, and because he was rejected, they would be rejected also. But as a result of the national rejection over and over again, how they hardened their hearts to him, he no longer spoke to them publicly. He withdrew from them. And he spoke to his own. It's the most intimate, most endearing, most passionate, most important, monumental time that he would have with his disciples in that three and a half years. Although the majority of the people thought they were religious, didn't they? And they were religious people. They just weren't spiritual. There is a difference, isn't there? Yeah, someone asks you whether you're a religious person or not, you should tell them no. No, but you're, you're spiritual people. Why? Because the Ruach HaGodesh... The Holy Spirit of God dwells within us, makes us spiritual beings now, alive spiritually, alive to God, alive to his work, alive to his word. Amen? But there are a lot of religionists even in our day, and we'll see that. We move into the text. It's not much different right now than it was then when Jesus was being rejected by the nation. Would you say that as a whole, the United States has rejected or accepted Jesus Christ? Yeah, people laugh. If it wasn't so grievous, it would be funny. But it's reason for lament, isn't it? 
It's reason for us to grieve when we see how there's been a wholesale rejection of everything we hold dear, of everything the Lord has taught us by the society in which we live now. But we'll see some other similarities as we go through this. And in chapter 16, we were doing a study on pneumatology. What is that? The Holy Spirit. And so we talked about the work of the Holy Spirit and how he works in the life of the believer. As Jesus came along, his disciples for three and a half years, getting their eyes to be opened, their heart to receive. And so the Holy Spirit comes alongside the believer in that para experience, para coming alongside, the parakaletos called to come alongside those whom God has chosen. And I, I, have, I have no indigestion when it comes to the doctrine of election. I'm thankful that God has chosen, right? Hmm, very clear. But nonetheless, when that Holy Spirit comes alongside us, as Jesus was alongside his disciples for three and a half years, opening up their mind, their hearts, their lives to the truth. And then we saw at the end of John's gospel, on that first day of the resurrection, he came among them in that upper room and he breathed upon them. And what did he say to them? Receive ye the Holy Spirit of God now. And that work of the Holy Spirit, what was what preposition was? N E N. And the result of the E N, of the N word work of the Holy Spirit, would be that we would display the fruit. If someone's living a fruitless life, then you really have to question whether they were ever saved to begin with. But when there's abundance of fruit that's being displayed in a person's life, not by what you say, but how you live your life, the way you love one another, the way you love God and therefore love one another, it displays that work of the Holy Spirit within. And that's where he begins to make that change within us. And it shows itself without through that fruit of the Spirit, which is described in one word, which is love. Love. Love is paramount. Love is supreme. The chief attribute of the God that we worship is love. Love. And then as we become more and more obedient to the Lord and to his work in our life and obeying his word, we begin to recognize and discern our calling in life. And as he told them that night, he breathed upon them, they received the Holy Spirit, but, but that was the first day of the resurrection. On the 40th day when he was going to ascend, what did he tell them? Tarry in Jerusalem. Go, go to Jerusalem and wait. Wait upon me until you receive the gift of the power of the Holy Spirit for the work of the ministry that I've called you to. And what's that Greek preposition? Epi, epi, where he comes upon. Now he has a calling upon every single person in my hearing, every one of you in this sanctuary and everyone over the internet. He has a calling upon every single one of our lives. The question is, have you really surrendered to allow him to work his work in you through that fruit of the Spirit so that you can be yielded to him and allow him to empower you for that calling he has for you? Or are you living your life? You see, we're going to see in a moment, we win by... How do we win, Levi? Grasshopper? You've got to pay attention when I speak to you, Grasshopper. <laughs> We win by losing, losing. Jesus won by losing, didn't he? Yeah. He who would seek to save his life will? Oh, but he who loses his life for my sake will? Yeah. That's true. Most have not experienced that truth, but it is absolutely true. And then when you enter that calling that he has for your life, then he empowers you for the same. It doesn't get any better than that, does it? No. But we need to yield to the work of God, this sovereign calling upon our life. Work out your salvation, Paul would say in Philippians, with fear and trembling. Do you fear that you would miss the calling of God upon your life? I hope you do. I do. I always wonder whether I'm really being all that he wants me to be in my relationship to my wife first and my relationship to my son and my relationship to you, the church, my relationship to my neighbors and the world around me. Am I really allowing him to love through me the way he desires to? Am I allowing that calling? Am I in fear of missing the opportunities that God would give me? And we have learned that through the person of the Holy Spirit, when we yield to him, we have the potential to love like no one else on earth can love, don't we? 
We can even love our... Wow, isn't that amazing? Yeah. How some of the Ukrainian soldiers are ministering to the Russian soldiers they capture. How they even treated their fallen bodies as sacred, offering them back to the <laughs> Russian commanders who refused to even take their bodies back. Can you imagine such a thing? Such a disregard for them. But we, we should have a high regard one for another. Hmm? in obeying that calling that God has upon our life. Jesus is trying to emphasize that here as he's speaking to them. And this will be the last time, because after this he goes out into the garden and we have the high priestly prayer of Christ in chapter 17. Chapter 17 is the Lord's prayer. The other prayer that we recite, that's not the Lord's prayer. Whose prayer is that? Our prayer. And aren't we glad we're beginning to see the realization of that prayer accomplished? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's happening. That's exactly what's happening today. The Lord's kingdom is coming. But we left off in verse 16 of chapter 16, so look with me there. Jesus had said some very distressing things to them already at this Seder, at this Passover. He said, first of all, I'm going to be leaving you. And that was distressing enough, wasn't it? Hmm? And then he said, one of you will betray me. He's going to have to cleanse the party in a minute, right? We saw that later on and we moved into uh, chapter 14. He identified the betrayer and he needed to leave. He was contaminating the rest of the group. But then he said, even, even you will forsake me and Peter, you will deny me. Oh my goodness. Well, how upsetting that had to be, right? But he was recognizing and they had not yet that in their flesh, in their own efforts, they were very weak do you recognize how weak you are apart from the work of the Holy Spirit in your life? I am helpless to do anything for God without the person of the Holy Spirit working within me. But I'm so thankful that in my weakness, his strength is made. It's true, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And so he said, a little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me because I go to the Father. Now, they're going to be very sorrowful about all of these things. There's going to be a tremendous pain that radiates through them emotionally, spiritually, mentally. And there's going to be a spiritual failure that they're going to experience. But Jesus has not given up on them, has he? As he'll never give up on us. Do we experience sorrow in this life and pain and spiritual failure? Sure we do. But we pick ourselves up and we pray and we ask God to work within us, and we keep moving forward. The worst thing we can do is sit sour and sulk, right? Have a pity party. No, 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 you can't do that. You've got to get up, you've got to get moving, you've got to allow the Lord to work in you. And that's what they're going to be doing. But right now, they're very, very sorrowful. Some of the disciples said among themselves, what is this that he says, a little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. Well, what was he speaking of? Now, remember, we, we know the whole story, the whole matter. And so we can clearly identify what he was saying, interpret the text. They couldn't, but they will. There'll come a time where they'll understand. But what was he referring to? His resurrection and ascension. He's going to ascend. They're gonna, he's going to die. He's going to be crucified. He's going to be put to death, and he'll be buried in the tomb. Oh, but three days later, he'll raise from the dead. And he'll be among them for 40 days, the pre-resurrection of Christ. And, and then he'll ascend up into heaven. So that's what he's referring to here. They said, therefore, what is this that he says a little while? We do not know what he is saying. And there was quite a conversation. According to the, the way in which the grammar is constructed here in the Greek, they had quite an in-depth discussion about this. And how was Jesus privy to it? Well, he's God. He knows everything, doesn't he? He knew exactly what they were discussing and what was troubling them. Now, Jesus knew that they had desired to ask him, and he said to them, Are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said a little while, and you will not see me? And again, a little while, and you will see me? Well, Jesus knows they, there's many things he shared with them that didn't understand. And they won't understand until later, till the Holy Spirit comes upon them and gives them understanding, revelation, and insight into what Jesus' words truly meant. And that's the case here, too. He's not going to address the question directly, is he? No, but time and through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and as they are progressing in their discipleship 
through the work of the Spirit in their life, they'll come to a greater and a deeper understanding of all these things. Is that not true of our own lives? Yeah. After some time in ministry, I've learned that there are a lot of questions that young Christians will ask that, that they're just not ready, they're not prepared for the answer yet. And so for a little bit of time and more revelation given by the Holy Spirit and his tutorship, his mentorship, then their eyes begin to be opened. A lot of young Christians, they'll really struggle with the sovereignty of God, particularly in election. You mean God has chosen some to be damned? Well, no, no. But as you grow and mature in your relationship with the Lord and your understanding of the word, your interpretive powers become greater and greater. The Bible's self-interpretive, isn't it? That's why we teach the Bible expositionally, 66 books. But you need to know all 66 books because there's an intricate message that it's all dovetail, all coming together, right? And as you study each book, you come away with a greater and a deeper understanding of the Bible as a whole. And the more you know of Scripture, the more your ability is to interpret Scripture, you see. And Jesus tells us that it would be the Holy Spirit who will lead us, mentor us, and guide us into all truth, the truth of the Scriptures. I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit. I'm thankful for the Spirit's work in the lives of so many wonderful teachers who've gone before us. Amen? Amen. Yeah. You're asking among yourselves what I said a little while. And you will not see me in a little while. You will see me. Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice and you will be sorrowful. Hmm. Is that not the case today? Are you not grieved today? Do you not lament? Saturday mornings, we men, we finished the book of Jeremiah and now we're in Lamentations. We finished the third lament of Jeremiah. The third chapter, song or poem of grief and sorrow. And I realize more and more, you know, the church has lost the ability to lament, to grieve. So glad that uh, our brother John Michael can stand up here and show you his grief, his lament, his sorrow when he shares these things with us. Have you lost the ability to lament? to weep with those who weep, to be sorrowful over what's taking place in our world. When there's such confusion, a Supreme Court justice nominee cannot identify what a woman is. I heard a good response to that. I'm not a veterinarian, but I know Amos is my dog. I know he's a dog, and I'm not a veterinarian. Do you need to be a biologist to be able to identify what a woman is or a man? Such confusion today. Does that not grieve you? Do you not lament over the insanity that's taking place in our day? That we've been given over to a reprobate mind as a society? This is madness. Sheer madness. That a judge in the highest court of the land can't make the same decision or come to the same conclusion that one of our five-year-olds can. Do you grieve? Did we ever think we'd see the wholesale slaughter of people again as we did in World War II that we're experiencing now and witnessing what has happened to the Ukrainians? Are you lamenting? Are you grieving? Do you go into your prayer closet with tears? If you don't, ask God to help you. Help you grieve again. Help you lament. Because this is a time in which we should be very sorrowful. Why? We're approaching the end of the age. And there's far too many people who really don't know Jesus. We're going to be talking about that as we move into chapter 16, to know the Lord. And that word know speaks of the intimacy of the communion, of the union you should have with the Lord. It speaks of the relationship that Abraham had with his wife Sarah. For Abraham knew Sarah, Yada, and she conceived and bore a son. That same concept is what is being used here in the New Testament when it talks about knowing the Lord. Do you really have communion with the Lord? Are you really one with the Lord? Then you adore what he adores. You grieve when he grieves. You rejoice when he rejoices. There's a lot for us to grieve about now, isn't there? They were sorrowful. They were in pain. 
They're in distress, but very soon it'll be turned to joy, won't it? Yeah. And so will ours, beloved. As Jeremiah witnessed the destruction of the nation, an entire generation lost. To some degree, so do we now. It is grievous. But when Jeremiah turned the corner on that third lament in that third chapter, he looked up. Instead of looking out and becoming distressed and setting looking within and becoming depressed, he looked up. And he realized the hope that he has, that it's eternal. His mercies are new every morning. Every morning. Mm. Yes, most assuredly, verse 20, I say to you that you will weep and lament and the world will rejoice and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. Hmm. For a woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that a human being is being born into the world. I think of that verse where it says that he endured the cross, the suffering of the cross for the joy that lied therein. What joy was there for the suffering in the cross? Your redemption, your salvation. Yeah. And so he uses that analogy here that the sorrow that they're experiencing now are like birth pangs. Does that sound familiar to you anywhere else in the New Testament? In the apocalyptic literature of Matthew 24 or... Mark 13, turn me to Matthew 24, verse 8. And we'll be getting into more of the uh, apocalyptic literature or the understanding of the end times, eschatology, on Wednesday nights. I encourage you to come out because this is where we live right now. We are in the beginning of birth pangs. So Jesus said... Beginning in verse 3 of chapter 24. And now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. Take heed, beloved. I'm praying. I'm praying that a lot of these people who are deceiving others would be exposed. There's so many deceivers who need to be exposed. They are deceiving others, and they themselves are deceived. And it's painful when we have loved ones that are falling for these deceivers, these who have crept in, otherwise known as creeps. <laughs> creeps. <laughs> and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Now, I hope you understand how quickly this thing could spiral out of control. I, I do believe that this is going to be, this is just the beginning of sorrows, of the birth pangs. But I do believe that this is going to cause more and more and more difficulties for the world, for the globe, and particularly for the unbeliever, the distress, the hopelessness that'll come about. They're talking about food shortages now, aren't they? Isn't that amazing? Build back better, he said, when he got elected, right? He's destroying everything. He's not building back anything, is he? And the three things that a nation should supply to its citizens, right? Food, water, energy, so that we can live productive lives. We know what's happened with our energy independence, haven't we? And now he's pleading with Venezuela, the dictator there, to purchase oil from the Venezuelans. How does that make all of those Venezuelan people who have been brutalized by this dictator feel? when we're supposed to be champions of democracy, of freedom, and individual rights. It's insane, isn't it? We just go from one dictator to another, right? And all that Venezuela becomes is the middleman. Do you know where the revenue goes that we would pay Venezuela for the oil that we would purchase from them? Russia, because they owe Russia a great deal of money. So we'd just be passing it through their hands. Isn't that amazing, the stupidity today? Wars and rumors of wars. 
See that your heart is not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Someone asked me, you know, is this the beginning of the tribulation? No, not yet. No, it's going to get a lot worse before that takes place. And nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines. What did they say? There'll be a lack of food. Hmm. Now, what happens when a citizenry experiences a lack of food? Food deprivation. Chaos and revolution. Upheaval. Yeah. Famines, pestilence. What is pestilence? Well, in the Greek text here, it's a malady or a disease for which there is no cure and it'll bring about death. I think the uh, COVID virus that we have been living through for, since 2020 is mild in comparison to what's coming. Pestilence, earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of sorrows. If you go back to your Greek lexicon, you'll see the beginning of sorrows is the word birth pangs. It's the word birth pangs. Odin, O-D-I-N in the Greek. Odin, meaning the pain that a woman would experience when she's about to give birth. That when you see these things, it's the birth pangs. It's the beginning of the new kingdom, his kingdom, his kingdom being birthed. Amen? For all these are but the beginning of sorrow. Look at Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. Uh, did I say Mark or did I say Matthew? Mark 13, I'm sorry. Thank you for correcting me. You're such an astute congregation. So thankful for that. Can't pull the wool over your eyes, can I? Nay, never. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 5, Matthew, uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 5. Take heed that no one deceives you. Once again, right? Listen, you listen with your... Because your ears will deceive you. You'll be deceived by what you hear. Some of the ministries that are most deceptive have some of the most glorious music you've ever heard. Composed. It's not sacred music because it's not of the Spirit of God. There's a seducing spirit. You remember Ahab and Jezebel? Wicked, wicked king, wasn't he? And God wanted to purpose his demise. And he said, hmm, how will I get him to go into battle? And what happened? A seducing spirit, a demonic spirit came forward and said, I will convince him. I'll seduce him to go into battle. And so he did. There's a seducing spirit working Predominantly through the music industry today. You understand that? Because so many people, it's not about what they think or what they believe. It's not about doctors, it's how you feel. It's that experiential Christianity and it's all emotion. It's all emotionally based. Beloved, be very, very careful. Do not, take heed, do not be deceived. Deceived. It's not about the music, it's about what they're teaching. And so much of it, it's not what they have said, it's what they have left out. It's what they haven't said. Hmm. So we live in that time where we need to take heed. Let no one deceive you. For many will come in my name saying, I am he and will deceive many. But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled for such things must happen. But the end is not yet for nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be national strife. There'll be ethnic strife and there will be earthquakes in various places. And if you paid attention to what's going on in the, in the Pacific and the ring of fire, it's amazing, the increase in the seismic activity. Not only will there be earthquakes in various places, but there will be famines and troubles, and these are but the beginnings of Odin. Odin, birth pangs, birth pangs. So I believe we're in the season of birth pangs. Jesus is using this analogy here. Go back to John 16. That you're going to be sorrowful now, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. As we're seeing the end of this age as we know it, isn't it sorrowful? Isn't it not grievous to see that this is another nation? This is not the nation I grew up in. Is it? And it's sorrowful, it's grievous, it's painful. But our 
sorrow will be turned to joy. Why? Because this is, just as he said, it's the beginning of the birth pangs, and the beginning of the end, the end of this age, as we know it. In dispensational theology, we call this what age? The church age. The church age. And when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, as spoken of by Jesus in the apocalyptic literature of Matthew, as well as by Paul in Romans, when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, what age will begin then? The, the age of Israel and the millennial kingdom. Hmm. For a woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. Jesus kept talking about his hour, didn't he? He would say, my hour is not yet. My hour is not yet come. Woman, what is that to me? My hour is not yet come. He said that to his mother. Well, if he's continually saying, my hour is not yet come yet, this is not my time, it's not my hour, then obviously this is a coming hour, isn't there? And beloved, listen to me, listen to me. This is, there's an expiration date on this age, isn't there? There is a very specific year, month, week, day, hour, and moment when everything is going to change. That Wednesday, 30, was it 36 days ago? The Ukrainians were going about their life as normal. Everything was normal. They were eating and shopping and dining and making arrangements, business arrangements, marriage arrangements. Everything was normal until that Thursday. What happened that Thursday? Russia, Russia invaded. Everything changed in a moment in time. My hour has not yet come. This is his hour. But understand, there's an hour coming upon the world that it has no idea and it was totally unexpected. It takes them completely by surprise like a thief in the night. And in one moment in time, everything's going to change. He kept talking about his hour. Because her hour has come, as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that a human being has been born into the world. That's true, isn't it? Yeah. We now have sorrow, but our sorrow is going to turn to joy. And that, listen, that joy won't be temporary. That joy will have no expiration date, will it? Our joy then will be how long? Eternal. Eternal. Isn't that amazing? That for an eternity... You won't have an anxious thought, a concerning thought, a fearful thought, a worry. If you had a worry, that would be worrisome. <laughs> it's impossible. Isn't that amazing? What heaven is going to be like. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. Happiness is based upon circumstances, circumstances right? So often God won't change our circumstances, but who does he change in the circumstances? You, you. Not so often what happens to us, what occurs in life, but how we react to it. That's what's most important, right? But happiness is based upon outward circumstances. Joy is an inter in inner quality that God gives us. It's part of the fruit of the Spirit, isn't it? Love, joy, peace yeah and he said no one no once you have the joy of his salvation that's what we're talking about it's not your joy and your salvation it's his salvation that gives us such a joy that is within us now that no one can steal that what's the worst thing that could possibly happen to you you go home <laughs> right that's the worst possible thing that can happen is you have to leave this life oh may it be today lord <laughs> Your joy will be eternal, not based upon your circumstances, based upon the relationship you have with him whom you love. Think about that joy when you first met your husband or your wife, when you first started to court one another, when you first started to see one another. Oh, boy. You couldn't stop thinking about it, could you? Hmm. When my heart opened up to having another relationship, another woman, in my life, and I reached out to Miss Gail. I was just so excited about the freshness and the newness of the relationship that we're having, the joy, my sorrow, my grief, two years of grief, turned to joy. 
And I'm so thankful, so thankful for her and for the relationship that God has given us. But it's all an extension of the relationship that each of, each of us have singularly, individually with him. That's where joy really springs from, doesn't it? Yeah. Your joy will be eternal, and no one can take it from you. Verse 23, and in that day, what day? The day of his ascension. You will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. He told us previously in the chapter, look at verse uh, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the helper, the parakletos, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. This is chapter 16, verse 8. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. I told you that's precisely how we witness. Of sin, because they did not believe in me. Righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. It was more than they could bear already. And the fact that he told them they was going away, there would be, one of them would be a traitor. They would all leave him, forsake him. And even Peter would deny him. That was more than they could handle. But isn't it wonderful how the Holy Spirit tutors us? How the Holy Spirit disciples us? How the Holy Spirit opens up our mind and our heart to the truth of God's word? And that's the mission of the Holy Spirit. No, you can't bear it now, he said. But verse 13, however, when he, when he, the spirit of truth... And it's so important that you embrace the truth. How often have I told you when I encounter someone who's, who's believing something that isn't true, my first question to them is, would, if what you believe isn't true, would you like to know? That's a reasonable question, right? If they say yes, praise the Lord. I, I got an open door. I can go ahead. If they say no, I walk away. God's not at work in that person's heart and life. What happened to you when you came to Christ? Previously, you were in pursuit of the truth. You know that. There was, there was a stirring within you, a gnawing, where you wanted to know what is true. Hmm? And that's what the Holy Spirit's job is, to lead you into all truth, for he is the spirit of truth. He will guide you into all truth, and he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Hmm. That's why we're doing the study of eschatology. There's some things coming. This is a time that we're approaching of which the Bible speaks more of than any other. Isn't it amazing? A third of the Bible is prophecy, and most of that prophecy deals with the second coming of Jesus. When we compare the prophecies concerning the first coming of Christ with the second coming of Christ, how many more times does the Bible, and particularly the New Testament, speak of the second coming? How many? Nine. Nine times more. The Bible speaks of the second coming of Jesus than the first coming. Everything that God said through the prophets came true, didn't it, with regard to his first coming? What's the assurance that you have the confidence that everything he said with regard to his second coming is going to take place? It's true. Absolutely certain. Hmm. So you've asked nothing, but now I'm leaving. And you'll ask, you'll pray, you'll beg, you'll ask for understanding, you'll ask for wisdom. You'll ask for power, and then empowerment will come through the person of the Holy Spirit. He began to talk to us about the Holy Spirit in chapter 14, so turn there for a minute. And don't stop asking, right? As Jesus said, knock, the door will be open. Seek, and you will find. Ask, and the answer will be given, right? Don't stop asking. Have an inquisitive mind. Think critically. There's so much for us to learn and we'll be forever learning about the Lord and his love and his purposes. But here, look at chapter 14, verse 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, contextually, what do you think he, should, he thinks you should be asking for? Salvation. Salvations. Absolutely true. You don't ask to get your own selfish needs met. That's a name it and claim it crowd, right? What do we call that? 
lip it and grip it, lab it, blab it and grab it, right? Positive confessionism, hmm? the prosperity gospel. You come to Jesus for all that you want to get. You come to Jesus for all that you can give. And where you give that more than any place else is to others. And what gift do we want to give them more than anything else is the gift of salvation. Hmm. Jesus said to the woman at the well, if you knew who it was that was speaking to you, you would ask me for a drink, right? And I would give you living water for the gift of God, Jesus said. The gift of God the Father is salvation, eternal life, a wellspring of joy and peace, love that can never end. So when we pray, when we ask, and contextually, that's what he's talking about. Look at chapter 15. Verse 15 of 15, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my father. I have made known to you. Yes, just as he said, he'll reveal all truth to us. Verse 16 in particular now, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain and that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you these things I command you, that you love one another. So in our prayers, when we're asking to God, God in the name of Jesus, we, we pray in the person, through the person of the Holy Spirit. We pray in Christ Jesus to God the Father. And what should we be praying for more than anything else to express the heart of God, the will of God? salvations salvations of others hey i'm going away but greater works than i've done you're going to do what would those greater works be how could we do anything greater than what jesus has done it's the multitude of salvations that would come through the work of jesus the spirit of christ the spirit of the holy spirit of god working through the church reproducing itself over and over and over again that's the greater work he's referring to when you pray and you ask in secret to the Father, what you're asking for is, is most precious, the salvation of others. Let's drive home the point. Go to 1 John, 1 John 5. The epistle of 1 John. Everybody there? 1 John, chapter 5. I have a heading over verse 14. Do you? Say it again, my dear. Confidence and compassion. Yes, yes. The confidence and the compassion that you have in prayer. Compassion for others and confidence that God will work. As he works within our heart to pray for others, it's the, the work he very work of salvation he intends to complete delight yourself in the Lord and what he shall give you the desires of your heart when you delight yourself in the Lord he implants his desires in your heart and those desires will always be for the sake of others to see the work of God in their lives hmm. but here in 1st John 5 beginning in verse 14 now this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. How is that interpreted today? In the craziness of today? It's terrible. You're the king's kids. There should be no poverty in your life, no sickness, no disease, no suffering. Where do you find that in the Bible? Where do you find that in the New Testament? It doesn't exist. We want, to, we want to share in the power of his resurrection, don't we? Well, how do we get there? Through the fellowship of his suffering. And his suffering was for this purpose of others. And so should our suffering be. And that's what he's talking about here. Ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked for. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin, which does not lead to death, 
He will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin, not leading to death. Oh, but there is a sin leading to death. I do not say that you should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. What in the world is he saying here? Now, we could be praying for the lost, our brothers universally, uh, not God the Father universally of every human being. Yes. yes, in the general sense, yes, of course he is. But God the Father specific in that more technical, narrow sense is the Father of all those who would believe in Jesus Christ, right? Now, we can interpret this as people sinning out in the world. We should warn them. We should pray for them. Pray that their sin doesn't take them out of this world. Pray that God would open their eyes, give them the grace gift of faith to believe, and that they would come to salvation and their life would be transformed. There's also those who are Christian who are not living the way they should. Yesterday, I was speaking to you fellows, remember? And I said, listen, you're one, one bad choice away from what? Acting just like that old man. You're one bad choice, one bad decision away from acting just like that old man or that old woman, ladies, all over again. Now, I believe once saved, always a forever saved. You can't lose your salvation. And the proof text that I gave of that last time on, on Saturday with the fellas was this man in Corinth that Paul was addressing. The Corinthian church was accommodating compromise with this man's sin. He was sleeping with his father's wife. Hopefully it was his stepmother, not his biological mother. But nonetheless, he's sleeping with his father's wife. And Paul said, it's not good that you tolerate this. He said, cast this one out for the destruction of the flesh. Deliver him to Satan, Paul says, very specifically. Deliver him to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that in the day of the Lord his spirit might be? Paul considered him a saved man. Isn't that amazing? So it is true, you know. Christians can act no differently than the rest of the unbelieving world. And that's why it's so hard sometimes to discern whether someone's really a Christian or not. They'll, they'll claim Christianity, but they act just like the world. And, and they have sin behaviors in their life that are no different than the rest of the world. Who's that world-class drummer that died the other day? Who was that, Eric? What was his name? Yeah, I'm trying to think of his name. I can't think of his name. He's a world-class drummer. 50 years old, dropped dead down in South America. What did they discover? He had 10, 10 different substances in his chemistry when they did a toxicity test. Ten. Drugs will destroy you, won't they? Drugs will take you out of this world. That's a sin that'll, that'll lead unto death, won't it? For many, many, many people. Right? And so what he's saying here is in line with what he said in chapter 14 of John. It's in line with what he said in chapter 15 of John. It's in line with what he's saying in chapter 16. When you pray and you go in your prayer closet, the most important prayers that you can pray if you're going to pray the heart of God is what? Salvation, Salvation of others. Your prayers, like his life, should be others-centered. Amen? Oh, but we are a selfish lot, aren't we? We are a selfish lot, aren't we? Yes, yes we are. <laughs> Lord, help us. Back to the text, John 16. Verse 23, so in that day you will ask me, you've asked me nothing so far, but most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Deborah, what, you, what were you so happy about last week? I retired. Huh? <laughs> you retired? I retired Friday, but no, I That's not why you were happy. Second the baby. Yeah. What a joy it is when a baby is born in a family. If any of you have any babies you want to discard, you don't bring them to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you get tired of them and you're impatient, bring them to me. Yeah, Gail and I will watch them. I love babies. They're wonderful, aren't they? Until they get old enough to talk back. <laughs> then you send the teenager out. <laughs> no, but what a, what a joy it is when it's new life. Right? And particularly in, in the church, in the family of God, what a joy it is when we see a new believer come to faith. Right? And we get the opportunity to help nurture them. Hmm? 
That's what he's referring to here. These things I have spoken to you, verse 25, in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. Yeah, he, uh, he said that in chapter 14 again, the work of the Spirit in verse 25 of chapter 14, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. He will bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I live with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be. We have nothing to fear. We need to be the most fearless people. And not only are we the ones who have the, most, the, the greatest capacity to love, but we have the capacity to live a fearless life. And that's what some of our brothers and sisters are displaying over there in the Ukraine to their unbelieving family and friends. They're living a fearless life. As John Michael pointed out, those two families in Syria... We lost everything, but we found the only thing that's really important in life. The only thing that's eternal. The only thing that's everlasting. Jesus. Hmm? Yes, these things I have spoken to you. Chapter 16, verse 25. In figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language. But I will speak to you plainly about the Father. It's the Spirit of Christ teaching us. Our prayers are through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the person of Jesus Christ, to God the Father. And then we'll know they're answered because we're praying in his will. In that day you will ask in my name, and I will not, and I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from him. All the children of the Father have access to the Father, don't they? Those girls of yours, Nathan? They can come to you anytime, can't they? Hmm? Because you love them. They know you love them. And so they have a boldness in approaching you and coming to you and making their demands known. (laughs) But you only give them what they need, right? Not what they want. So to our Heavenly Father, and we as His children, we can come directly to the Father. Why? Because the Father loves us. Why? Because we love the Son. And the Son dwells within us. So when God looks down upon us, He looks down in us, and he doesn't see me any longer. He doesn't see my sinfulness. He doesn't see my wicked heart. What does he see? Jesus, the righteousness of Jesus. Yeah. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world again, and I leave the world to go to the Father. So important. Look at chapter 13 again. Chapter 13, as we begin this discourse, this last Seder, Passover, that Jesus would celebrate with his disciples. Chapter 13, now, before the feast of the Passover, when the Jews knew that, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He who began that good work in you will complete it until the end, until the day of Christ Jesus. Are you confident of that very thing? Now, how do we have confidence in that? You'll have confidence in that as you're yielding to the Holy Spirit and allow him to work within you. Yes, I work out my salvation with fear and trembling, as I mentioned before, but what's the rest of that verse? Knowing that it's God who works within you, both to and to. You don't have the desire, nor do you have the ability, unless God gives it. But you know that when you have the desire to live a godly life, just as God has commanded us, and then he empowers you to do the same, then you can have every confidence of knowing that he who began that good work in you will complete it unto the day of Christ Jesus. Hmm? Yeah, but in chapter 13, the feast of the Passover, Jesus knew his hour had come and that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world and loved them to the end, and supper being ended, and the devil having already entered into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus knowing, very important to our our text now, verse 3, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. All authority has been given to him on heaven and earth, right? All things. And that he had come from God and that he was going back to God. Very important. Do you know? You, You didn't create yourself, did you? Where'd you come from? From the heart of God. 
God brought you into existence. God has a plan for your life. And when we surrender to God and we yield to God and we come to know, to yada the Lord, to have this communion, this intimacy with him, then we have every confidence that one day when I exhale for the last time, I'm going back to God, just as Jesus knew. Listen, that's why we can be fearless. What do we have to be afraid of? Back to the text, John 16. Verse 28, yes, I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go back to the Father. His disciples said to him, see, now you are speaking plainly, using no figure, to, figure of speech. Verse 30, now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this, we believe that you have come forth from God. So they're saying that, you know, he, he read their mind. He knew exactly what their conversation was about. He indicates that he's, there's nothing he doesn't know. You can't inform God of anything, can you? Stop those information prayers. He already knows. <laughs> but then he goes on to say, Jesus answered in verse 31, do you now believe? Now, the way that's constructed, he's, he's saying, oh, now you're, you're finally catching on. Okay, here we go. We're at first base anyway, right? Elementary. Oh, but they're going to, this is the progression that's taking place in the life of a believer who really is apprehended by the Holy Spirit. He gets you on this walk of salvation, but then there has to be that sanctification that play, takes place, that discipline, that discipleship that goes on in your heart, in your mind, in your life, where more and more the Holy Spirit has taken monopoly of your life, where he becomes the Lord of all your life. For if he's not the Lord of all your life, there's a good chance he's not the Lord. the Lord at all. Do you understand that? Our world today has a disdain for lordship salvation. All the one emphasizes the hyper grace that is so easy to embrace. That you can have a lost life and a saved soul. It's not possible. Nowhere in the scriptures does it accommodate that belief. Nowhere. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Isn't that what he said? So you can't have a lost life and a saved soul. It's incompatible. No, if you have a saved soul, it'll display itself in a sanctified life, a transformed life, that all of your priorities, all of your desires, all of your passions, they all change. Your thinking changes. Yeah. Do you now believe? Hmm. Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has come that you will be scattered, each one to his own, and you will leave me alone. Go to Matthew 26. In the night he was betrayed and arrested. Verse 54, how then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? In that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, this is chapter 26 of Matthew's gospel. I'm reading in verse 54 now. How then could the scriptures be fulfilled? It must have happened thus. In that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. And then, and then, all. all the disciples forsook him and fled. They were growing in their faith. They had, they had a little faith then. Oh, now you believe, he said. <laughs> well, let's see how much you really do believe. Hmm? Here he's predicting in verse 32 of John's gospel in, six, in chapter 16 that they will all forsake him. All will be scattered, each one to his own. Is that true? Did that happen? No, it didn't. No, it didn't. There were three groups to the party that night, right? There was a betrayer. He was a disciple in name only. 
Eventually he was found out, wasn't he? Yeah. What did he love? He didn't love Jesus. What did he love? Money. Money. 30 shekels of silver, right? We talk about that. I'm sorry, I have to bring it up again. But you know what percentage of the church dies? So what do you love? What does those 98% love? They're no different than Judas. Many ways. I, I don't understand it. You see, when Jesus wants your life, he wants the totality of your life. And the, the least that you give him, the least that you give him is your money. What do we call that? Filthy what? Lucre, right? Judas thought more of 30 pieces of silver than he did the person of Jesus Christ. I, I don't know. I don't know what it says to the, about those other... It's, 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 it's scary. It's frightening. It's grievous. I lament over the disobedience of people who claim to be God's people. So there was a betrayer, and he was found out. And all those betrayers, they'll be found out. In the time of the end, they'll be, you know, Lord, Lord, didn't we? And what did he say? Depart from me, I never... We never had communion. I never yada the Lord. What did I say about the word yada? Abraham yada Sarah and she, and brought forth a child, right? When you have that kind of, listen, I'll do anything for that woman's care. When I married her, I said, I will take care of you until the day I die. And I'll meet your every need. Want? Need? Yes. I'm so thankful for the woman that God gave me. But I, 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 and that's my commitment to her. And in my love, I will commit to caring for you more than I care for my own self. That I'll take care of you. I'll provide for you. And, and we, you know, fellas, if you're not making plans, God forbid you should leave before your wife, you should be making plans to make sure they're well taken care of should that take place, should that occur as much as you're able, right? It's amazing to me the number of people, and particularly pastors that I know, who've made no preparation for their departure to take care of their families. I know far too many who've left, and their wives were left in a terrible situation financially. That should never be, should it? No, we have a responsibility. Hmm? I have a greater responsibility to the Lord, don't I? So there was Judas, there was a betrayer, and he was found out. All the betrayers will be found out. Depart from me, I never knew you, worker of iniquity, right? That left the 11. All of you will forsake me. Is that true? No. 10 did. 10 sought their, what does it say? Come on, look at the text. It's an open book. Verse 32. Yes, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each one to his home. You, you know those three fellows that came to Jesus at various times, and they would say, me first, let me first, me first. You, you don't remember any of those texts? Oh, yeah. yeah. That, that's this crowd, the, the me first. They ran, why? Seeking their own. But that's not true of all of them. Now, where I, I, you know, God's sovereignty, man's free will, it's so hard to reconcile that, isn't it? The two. But John's love for Jesus, John the Apostle, John the Beloved, you know. Peter was the Apostle of hope. Paul was the Apostle of faith. John was the Apostle of love. His love for Jesus would not allow him to leave him alone. It would not allow him to forsake him. Yeah, he came to his own. We read that earlier in the text, that, that not in chapter 16, but previously in chapter 14. He came to his own, to, the, to, to Israel, to the nation of Israel, and his own received him not, right? His own rejected him. There's another coming in his own name because Jesus came in the Father's name, but there's another coming in his own name and him they will receive. They'll think he's the Messiah. Who's that? Antichrist. Amazing, amazing. That the wholesale rejection of Jesus is what we are experiencing here in our nation now. But, but like Judas, there are many betrayers. When we gather together every Sunday morning, it's wonderful that the Spirit of God is here. Who else is here? 
Who? Satan. Satan. The enemy's here too. Don't make any mistake about that. You need to be very, very discerning about the enemy's work, his methods, his schemes, his methodologies. So Judas was among them, but Jesus took care of that, didn't he? He exposed that. But then you had the 10 who sought their own. They were young in their faith, and they, they really needed to come to a place where they were really willing to surrender everything to Jesus. Now, John was there. John didn't forsake him. Who else was with John at the cross? The women. The women. Fellas, our wives have so much to teach us about love, real love, sacrificial, unconditional love, you know? Many times I was raising my son, and you know what I think of my son, but there were times I thought he's a brat. You know, I told my wife, take care of this brat, this son of yours. <laughs> but when he really needed compassion, understanding, comfort, did he come to me? No. Who did he go to? His mother. His mother. Yeah. If he wanted to man up, <laughs> We have a lot to learn, fellas, from the love that God places within a woman's heart for her family and a woman's devotion for the Lord. These women were so devoted, weren't they? John, in his love for the Lord, and it was an unusual love, a supernatural love, he was willing to risk his own life by being at the cross. You understand that? And identifying with Jesus... There's another peculiarity about John as compared to the other 10. And what was that? Um, excuse me? What? Okay, he was young. What else? I'm sorry? He's the only one that wasn't martyred. The other 10 were all martyred. But John wasn't martyred. They tried to kill John, didn't they? What did they do to him? They gave him a skin treatment. Oil of Olay. They boiled him in oil. Couldn't kill him. Amazing. Supernatural. Then they set him on the Isle of Patmos to do what? Crack rocks the rest of his life. And what happened in that divine isolation? He got the greatest revelation of Jesus Christ and his return to this planet than any man has ever... What is it to you, Peter, if this man should remain until I come? Remember that? Peter questioned Jesus with regard to Joe. What about the boy? What about the boy? <laughs> he had such a love for Jesus. Children are so innocent at times, right? And this young man, he was still very innocent, very childlike in his faith. And Jesus said, what is that to you if he remains until I come? So everybody believed that, that John wasn't going to die. Jesus was going to come before John died. Did, Jesus, did John see Jesus' is coming? Yes, he did. The revelation. He actually saw the return of Jesus Christ. Hmm? Amazing. Greatest revelation any man was ever given of the glory of Jesus Christ. Why? He was willing to lay down his life for the Lord. We'd all like to think we'd do that, don't we? The only way you can have any confidence of knowing that you would do that is how? By living for him today. You can have every confidence you would die for him if that was ever going to be necessary. But the way you would know that by living for him today. Now, I'm not asking you to speak out loud just in the quietness of your own heart. In what areas of your life are you compromising on what you know to be true in the way in which you should be living? That's a problem. It's, it's a hindering from God from doing all that he wants to do in your life. God has nothing but the highest and best in mind for you, for our marriages, for us individually, for our parent-child relationships, for every other relationship. And all we need to do is surrender completely and totally to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He is the Lord, Kurios, Jesus, Yeshua, the Christ, the Meshach, the Messiah. But he's Lord first. Paul didn't argue, did he? One of the greatest minds, I think, that, that ever comprehended the, the will and the purposes of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when he was apprehended on that Damascus road, Lord, who are you? Kurios, who are you? Supreme in heaven and earth. That's what it means. You're Lord of my life. Who are you? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting, Paul. Oh, you can't be. No. That guy's a heretic. Is that what he said? What were the next words out of his mouth? 
Lord, what would you have me do? I surrender. And from that moment on, the chief persecutor of the church became the chief persecuted. And nobody, nobody in history, in church history, has lived more for Jesus Christ than that man. Lord, what would you have me to do? He's Lord first and foremost. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things I command you to do? So listen to me this morning. I'm begging you. I'm grieved. I lament over the state of the church. Do you? Now, I, I, I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but you know if I'm talking to you. You know if the Holy Spirit is confirming that you're surrendered to God, and you know if the Holy Spirit is convicting in the areas that you're not surrendered to God. How can you be so foolish? How can you be so insane? How can you allow so much of your life to be martyred unnecessarily? Not in a good sense. I'm talking about in a negative sense now. When God has so much more in mind for you, would you listen to the Holy Spirit? To the, to the extent this morning, and you know, you know exactly what I'm talking about because the Holy Spirit's talking to you right now. To the extent that you're not being obedient to the Lord in whatever area that is, surrender. Time's running out. Yesterday's gone. And you can't get it back. But we have today. And we can recommit ourselves to Jesus today to be like the Apostle John. So much of what was happening at this very time is very much like what's happening in our day. Do you understand that? And there's going to be a segment of the church that's going to be like John. It'll be a remnant. It'll be very small. But there'll be a segment that'll be like the other ten. As we go through the eschatology, I'll give you my particular bent on eschatology and what is going to take place. But we do know that coming through the tribulation of those days, a time of trouble such that will never be again, nor ever was, that coming through that tribulation will be a myriad, an innumerable number of tribulation saints. Is that true? And are they Jew or Gentile? No, the Gentile. Chapter 7 of Revelation. Two groups of people that survived the tribulation. 144,000 sealed of Israel. 144,000 Apostle Pauls going through Israel. Evangelizing the Jews there in Israel. But then there is an innumerable, innumerable number of Gentiles who go through the tribulation of every tribe, nation, people, and tongue. What are they? The Gentiles. What, 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 what is that about, beloved? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Paul said when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, the church age is over, God pours out his spirit upon Israel for salvation. So how did all these Gentiles come to salvation if God is working primarily, predominantly among the Jews at this time? And it's an innumerable number of people. He can count an army that crosses the Euphrates. How many was that? 200 million. But he can't count this number of people. Innumerable. Who come out of the tribulation and wash their robes, their robes white through martyrdom. One was a betrayer. We have a lot of those. The nation rejected him. Yes, yes, yes. Ten wanted to live their own life, seek their own. Now listen to me, that's, that's happened way too much and way too often and way too long in all of our lives, hasn't it? Living our own life. I'm, I confess. One, one was willing to risk everything to live for Jesus. One, May Jesus Lord of all. You get the point? Shall we stand? I don't need to say anymore. <laughs> 